Before we get started, I have to tell you about a brand new investment opportunity. On Call Capital is pleased to present you with a unique opportunity to partner in the acquisition of the Palazzo Apartments, a 92-unit community situated in the heart of San Antonio and less than 200 yards from San Antonio Medical Center. This is our second offering from QC Capital, and we expect this off-market opportunity to fill up very quickly. This is a 506C offering, meaning that you need to be an accredited investor to invest. If you've been looking to build your passive income streams, this is a fantastic opportunity to get started. For more information, reach out to me at bobby at oncallinvestments.com or use the link in the show notes to schedule a call with me. Now, on with the show. Welcome to the Plan B CRNA podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Jones, and I'm so excited that you're here. The Plan B CRNA podcast is the only show made specifically for nurse anesthetists who are exploring options outside of their traditional career paths. This is the place to expand your mind and your goals as we uncover new ways to produce side income together. Join me for some honest, unscripted discussions with other CRNAs who are transforming their financial lives. This episode is brought to you by On Call Capital. On Call Capital is dedicated to educating CRNAs and other healthcare providers about investing outside of the traditional stock market. On Call Capital also provides opportunities for you, yes, you, to create passive income and generational wealth while also lowering your taxable income through investments in the apartment and alternative investment spaces. If you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure you do that right now so that you don't miss an episode. Thanks so much for joining me today. And now on with the show. Welcome to another episode of the Plan B CRNA podcast. I thought that it would be nice today to dive into a tax topic that remains pretty underutilized by far too many high earning professionals who are trying to build their wealth. And what better way to do that than to have an expert on the show? So having helped clients complete over $50 million in sales through 35 plus transactions, Alex Olson is an expert in helping 1031 exchange clients. Alex and his colleague, Logan Freeman, are taking real estate brokerage to the next level. They've developed a proven system for helping 1031 exchange clients identify those cash flowing deals, develop a trusted team, and ensure that your 1031 exchange money is secure. Alex, it's great to have you on the show today. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. I, this is a blast so far. We're, we're getting into it. Absolutely. So, uh, well, let's dive right in. Uh, tell me a little bit about your commercial real estate background. Yeah, so I have actually been an investor in commercial real estate for maybe four years now. Uh, and then shortly after I started investing in commercial real estate, I loved the process so much and decided it was time to get my actual real estate license. And so I did and um, interviewed all the brokers in town trying to figure out where I'd be a good fit. And I really landed at uh, a place I'm no longer with now, but Clemens Real Estate, which is where I met Logan Freeman. And he had a passion for working with buyers uh, who were looking for commercial real estate property. Uh, and specifically in, typically they were under a 1031 exchange deadline, which I know we're gonna get into more, uh, but we felt there was a need in the market, especially coming into Kansas City where we have a lot of out-of-state investors, which I'm sure, you know, your listeners are either out-of-state investors, passive investors, or looking to invest maybe in their in their backyard. But the point being is, uh, you know, it's it's kind of a hot area. And, um, you know, we just wanted to take advantage of buyers who are looking for, uh, you know, great investments. Yeah, that Kansas City market is has definitely been... Uh you know, pretty good over the last several years. So, and it, and it looks like the trajectory is, is going to continue uh, in that direction. But uh, I do, you know, obviously this is a podcast about that 1031. So, um, you know, was it that kind of beginning part where you had a lot of 1031 clients? So you just were driven to focus more on that 1031 side? Is that what, what has driven you to take this route? What, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So when you take a step back and you go, okay, there are literally millions of buyers out there, right? And buyers in any typical sense, they're not motivated necessarily to buy something. Yeah, they might have money they want to deploy or maybe kind of need to deploy because it's cost them a few dollars. But um, they're really oftentimes looking for a needle in the haystack. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. But when you add on the 1031 exchange aspect to it, you have a hard deadline for finding and identifying and buying a property. Otherwise, you could have massive tax consequences. And so that is very stressful for somebody, typically for somebody who's in an exchange deadline. And so we take a look at that and say, okay, how can we actually make this process? And it applies to all buyers too, Mm -hmm. but how can we make the 1031 exchange process very simple for buying a property here in Kansas City or Kansas and Missouri and uh, really make it more of a white glove service? Because Mm -hmm. there are so many people that are under a deadline. And that's, you know, really where we fell in love with working with these people. All right. So, well, and, and, Tax stuff in general, uh, you know, you mentioned the consequences, the massive consequences, and and you know, we all talk about getting a good CPA so that you you make sure that you're protected and you're doing the right things under the tax code, which is very complicated and convoluted. But um, you know, it it can get that way. Just you know, I don't know how else to explain it. The tax code is just way too complicated. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, especially for me. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so what I want to do, though, is is just start off with that basic definition, you know, just pretend like I'm a fifth grader and explain the concept of the 1031 exchange to me. Yeah. So the 1031 exchange is actually a federal tax code so that it's state agnostic, meaning any state, we all use the same 1031 exchange uh, guidelines. And it was put into place 100 years ago uh, or so. And what it is, it allows you to sell an investment real estate property. So it's got to be investment real estate. Um, And you can then sell that and defer all of the capital gains tax that you would normally have on that by buying another investment real estate property. And that it doesn't mean that you're avoiding taxes, it means you're deferring them to a later point in time. However, also with the 1031 exchange, you can continually do this until what we call exchange until you drop, right? Because Mm -hmm. even when you die, all those tax deferments that you've made on the gains that you've had as you continue to exchange, they die with you. So your family is not obligated uh, to to carry that over to the, you know, to the next generation, uh, which is another advantage, um, which leaves it up to your choice. Hey, do I want to sell this when I'm you know, 86 years old and, and pay taxes on it? Or do I want to, you know, keep it until I die and give it to my family? And they can do whatever they want to with it. Now, of course, they're always going to pay gain, you know, they would pay gains tax on it if they sold it. But anyway, in, in the simplest form, that's what it is. You're, you're selling one investment property in real estate, in, any kind, any kind of investment real estate property, farm ground, apartments, industrial, multi, you know, whatever it is, into any other kind or any same kind investment real estate. So again, you could be selling farm ground and go into apartments. You can be selling farm ground and go back into farm ground uh, or selling apartments and going into apartments. So uh, that that is, is another common misconception as well. Do I need to sell the, you know, and buy the same thing? No, you don't. And also any state. So you could be selling a property in, in for example, California or North Carolina and buy something in Kansas City. It, it doesn't matter. It's a federal tax code. Okay. Um, so that there's a lot to unpack there a little bit. So, I mean, I've had several people that have approached me about 1031 opportunities and, um, you know, specifically the idea of, you know, they, they don't necessarily want to go the 1031 route. They're, they say, well, I, I'll just, I'll pay the taxes now. I don't want to pay the taxes later. Um, Mm -hmm. they don't want to pass that tax burden onto your kids. But, uh, from what I'm hearing, that might not necessarily be the best approach if you're looking to, uh, lower your taxes and your tax burden, correct? That's right. So, I mean, there's a million different examples that we could go about and look at it. So I'll just look at, uh, a tax strategy. So let's say, for example, you've owned a fourplex for, let's call it 25, 30 years. So that property has been depreciated out, right? Mm-hmm. So then now then when you come up on doing taxes, there's no depreciation left for you, especially if you've done some other advanced tax strategies, such as cost segregation, some of these other things. Regardless, you have no ability to depreciate that asset. But what you could do is you could actually sell that property, that fourplex, and go buy another property and then start depreciating that on the same tax schedule. 
So that's uh, one advantage for somebody who's held a property for a really long time. Another advantage is taking that same example, you've got a fourplex you've maybe owned for five years, you bought it for $200,000. Now it's worth $400,000. Not only do you have an extra $200,000 in equity that you can put into something else that you're not really tapping into, you also have, you know, it's been paid down a little bit by, you know, your tenants because they're paying you rent. So you can actually do what we call levering up. So you're going to lever up, you're going to take your four units that you bought, uh, and then you're going to buy, you're going to sell those, and you're going to exchange into eight units or 16 units, depending on the market you're coming in and out of. Mm -hmm. There are so many people that are sitting on, maybe it's even their first home. They, they bought their first home, you know, five, eight years ago, got into real estate investing, or, you know, moved out of it, but put a renter in there. And now they're like, geez, I got this, you know, million dollar house here in California or New York or Texas. And, but it's not really making me any money because it's worth a million bucks now. What can I do about that? Well, you can sell that, defer your taxes and exchange into a cash flowing market uh, and really propel your wealth forward. Okay. So uh, let's just take, you know, for instance, a uh, $100,000 home that appreciates to 200000 So mm -hmm. what kind of a tax savings are we talking about here um, when we talk about the, the tax deferment and, and tell me how that can kind of balloon over time. Yeah. So in the example you gave, so you already have in that example, a hundred thousand dollars of gains uh, that would be taxed if you sold it and pocketed that gain. Mm -hmm. Right. So that $200,000, that hundred thousand dollars in gains is going to be taxed at, it all depends on your tax bracket, your CPA or whatever, but let's just call it 25%. Mm -hmm. So right off the top, you're, you're paying Uncle Sam $25,000 um, just to put $75,000 in your pocket. And rather than doing that, you could sell that, keep all $100,000 in gain, buy something that's worth, uh, you know, four, eight hundred, let's call $800,000 because you have $200,000 that you're selling. Well, you can leverage 25% or sorry, leverage 75%, uh, maybe even 80%, depending on what market you're coming in and out of. And oh, now, by the way, you've got something that's worth $800,000. It's cash flowing. It's being paid down. It's appreciating. If you're using real estate as a get rich quick kind of uh, methodology, the 1031 exchange may not be the best option for you. But most people, uh, you know, unless you're doing house flips and those kind of things, are really kind of using uh, real estate as wealth building, either a side hustle or maybe it's kind of full time, but you know that the end goal is just continuing to build on wealth. Uh, that's another thing that's great about real estate. There's a million different ways to do it and, and make a lot of money. It's just about being smart and dedicated. So in, and in that example, um, you know, so you pay the $25,000 in taxes, that's $100,000 less uh, purchasing power that you have because mm -hmm. you paid those taxes. So instead of like, if you decided to not do a 1031, now you can afford a $700,000 property yep. instead of an 800,000. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that affects your purchasing power and, you know, it, it can affect your cash flow ultimately, how quickly you're able to build that cash flow. Mm -hmm. up. And so, and that's just with the first transaction. We're talking about one transaction here. So when you talk about doing this, you know, let's say you do it three or four times in a row. Um, that becomes a very, very powerful thing uh, in, in my estimation. I, you know, and, and you're, you're the expert here. So um, I'd be curious to know when you talk about, you know, hey, this isn't something where it's a get rich quick thing. Real estate can be that way, but this is not. But mm -hmm. how, how much more quickly can it actually propel your wealth? Yeah, and I have a really great case study. So uh, a person, actually, he's a vet, local investor here in Kansas City. I met him through just connections and those kind of things. He actually, over time, he was a, a residential real estate doing single family homes, fourplexes, those kind of things. Over time, he had bought uh, four fourplexes all in a row on the same street by knocking on doors, asking for contact information of who owns a building. So in about six months, he bought four different fourplexes, various prices, mm -hmm. okay? He packaged them up. 
he made some improvements to them and he sold all the, this is all through, through us. We actually helped him sell those to another person who uh, incidentally was also doing a 1031 exchange, but he sold those to another person. And so he took those 16 units that he bought over six months or maybe it was a year or somewhere around that because he's able to defer the gains on it. He took all that money. Oh, by the way, one of his friends was also doing a 1031 exchange. They combined their equity they had together. So he took his 16 units, combined an equity with a friend of his who was selling something else, and they bought 91 units. Wow. Um, all within you know, a three month period of doing this whole process of going under contract, finally selling, uh, identifying a property, closing that thing out. Um, and now he's actually looking to sell that property. So those 91 units for a hefty, pretty penny because he put some money into it and he mm -hmm. bought it at a great price. And now he's looking to buy 250 units. And this is all a matter of the last three years. So this is a a really great example, but this guy also works very, very hard and stays in very, very good contact with, um, you know, people in the market sure. and had this kind of planned out, but that's the power of the exchange. If he would have taken, just paid taxes on that, whatever it is he was trying to do and, and combining with another investor, that really wouldn't be applicable. Applicable. He would only had, you know, 25% less than whatever his actual gains were. Mm -hmm. on that property to go out and try and leverage. So there's no way any of this would have worked without the 1031 exchange. Yeah. Um, and so that's just kind of the, uh, a good example of someone in a short period of time going from really kind of four units to 91 units in like two and a half years. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that that's uh, an extreme case, but definitely can happen with really hard work and, and thinking through things. Yeah. And I just, um, you know, I, we just did our first two 1031 exchanges for, uh, two of our first investments that we made, uh, at the time it was, uh, right around the two year mark. So two of our multifamily investments, uh, passive investments came, uh, to full term, they were sold mm -hmm. and we got, uh, about a 1.75 equity multiple on one and a 1.88 on the other, I think. So, um, you know, we were able to 1031 those into the next deal and mm -hmm. automatically, you know, increase our cash flow. But uh, I, I'm, you know, it was an easy process for us. But mm -hmm. I know that that can't be, uh, that's not always the case. And so uh, what is it that can make or break that effort to utilize the 1031? And, and what are, uh, I guess, what's the timeline? Because yeah, uh, yeah. we haven't gotten into that yet. So what's the timeline mm -hmm. for performing a 1031 exchange? Yeah. So again, this is a federal guideline. So the time, the time is very hard and uh, meaning it's, there's no wiggle room in it. Okay. And so from the moment you sell your down leg, the, what we call a down leg property, which is the property you're selling your, your investment property from the day that thing closes, you have 45 days to identify up to three properties. Okay. And that is absolutely hard and fast deadline. I don't care if it's on a Sunday. I don't care if it's on a Christmas day. Um, that's a deadline. I don't care if you get sick, whatever it is. So um, you have 45 days from that day of closing. And then another important deadline is you have six months from that day to close out one of those three properties. So the day you close is very, very important to understand and then where you you come in and you land on actually closing out your other uh your, you know any of those deals my advice is with all of anybody who's considering or under a 1031 exchange deadline is to definitely have within the first 10 to 15 days at least one or two or three properties identified that you've delivered to your qualified intermediary and we can talk about that too because again, like the examples I gave before, what if you get sick? What if you get hit by a car? What if, you know, these different things, you want to at least have something in the, in the back burner of stuff you've identified. You don't have to close on them, but just get them identified to your qualified intermediary. You can always change those up until the 40, 45th day at, well, depending on your qualified intermediary, but at midnight or 1159. Um, so those are the hard and fast rules. There's other ancillary rules if you want to get creative on, 
you know, different rules like the 200% rule. But then if you identify, you have to close all of those out and it just gets more complicated. Mm -hmm. It really is only for people that have done a 1031 exchange before or, or are forced into it via some other means. So I want to get back a little bit to the qualified intermediary importance. Yes. Because you have to, before you even close on this property you're selling, you got to make sure the qualified intermediary has control, is going to have control of your funds. The second you touch the money, it's no, it's hundred percent taxable. So as so, an individual, you cannot do this on your own. You have to use somebody who's, who's in the middle. That's right. right. Okay. Yep. And I mean, you know, you look up the definition of qualified intermediary, it really just means somebody who's not related to you. However, um, highly recommend using people that have done thousands of these a year because, you know, they're again, like I was telling you before, they're going to know the how to stretch the 45 day rule to the limit because, you know, some of them will allow you, like I said, to text you at 1159 p.m uh on your 45th day to identify your properties so those are all very important keys and don't just use a cpa that you know your friend uses use somebody who really does it every single day just like a you know real estate broker or agent or whatever you want somebody who's very very well uh versed in it and there's some really great ones out there cool cool so um i guess my next question is um what are some of the misconceptions or myths about the 1031 exchange uh, that you've run across that, you know, in, in your experience, it's like, oh, wow, I, you know, you, you go into it and you think one thing and maybe that's not the, you know, exactly what happens. Yeah. So a good example of this is uh, we've had, you know, clients do this where they come in and they think that they, you know, there's four, let's say there's four fourplexes, right? Well, you can only identify three properties, they think. Well, if those four fourplexes are owned by the same uh, person, that would be considered one property to identify. So you have to really kind of understand the packaging of properties. Now, if those four fourplexes are owned by somebody else, you know, two, four different individuals or three different, you know, all those kind of things do factor into it. But you can buy somebody's portfolio, even single family homes. I want to buy 32 single family homes that one owner has um for my exchange you can do that you just have to make sure it's the same owner at least structured with a one contract and, and all that kind of stuff so your agent and your qualified intermediary really need to know uh what they're doing when they're handling your your 1031 exchange so that's a, a big myth that is pretty common the other one i touched on before mm -hmm. which is you know hey I, i'm buying uh, single family, or I, I'm selling a single family home. Can I buy a industrial building? Yes, you can. Uh, another one that's a little bit of a, a different take on it is I'm selling 16 units, um, but I only want to buy two units. Can I do that? Yes, you can, assuming that the price of those two units is greater than or equal to the price that you're selling those 16 units. So you can downsize in unit count, but you cannot downsize in purchase price. Um, and there's other rules in there related to debt that you have to replace and some of these other things. But typically if you follow the rule of at least buying to the sale price of the property that you sold, you should be fine. But again, that's all a qualified intermediary thing and your CPA and making sure that you've got all your ducks in a row so what about um let's say you you own a single family home um and you're just tired of managing it and you're like you know i just want to take this money i want to sell this property and take all of that and just throw it into the stock market let me let me just put it into uh you know and, and let's say for this case i want to put it into this reit you know mm -hmm. the, the real estate investment trust uh can you do that or is that something that is not allowed by the 1031 exchange rules that would not be allowed by the 1031 exchange you cannot take real investment funds uh, and defer taxes into a security product so even though a REIT is real estate investment you're not actually owning real property you're owning the operations of those property so you're really kind of owning a, a different structure so you have to go from real property to real property 
uh, in, in order to satisfy a 1031 exchange. Now you can do it, but you're going to pay taxes on it. It's not really a 1031 exchange. Yeah. So, and and that's a I think an important distinction between um, you know the syndication model versus the the securities you know real estate investment trust model. Um, you can certainly diversify in REITs all that you want to, but the, you don't get the tax benefits that you can by owning real real estate, uh, even if that is as a limited partner, passive investor in a uh, a multifamily syndication. So that's right. That's right. Yeah, the syndication model is a little bit different, as you already touched on, and and, and you know, and you can, um, you know, once as a limited partner it becomes more difficult, but you can ten thirty one exchange funds in and out of that through a tick model or continue to roll with the syndication. Um, but that's uh, you know gets into more of a syndicator question, um, and you kind of have to follow their rules versus you know, what you want to do with your funds because you're a limited partner in it. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, deal flow a little bit. Um, you know, being, a, you know, on on the equity firm side of this, um, it can be difficult to come across deals, it, you know, especially with multifamily, you know, kind of tightening a little bit. Uh, sometimes deals are a little harder to come by. So how can you ensure that you have, deals for people when they when they have these you know when they want to come to you with their 1031 exchange funds yeah and that is a very important aspect of it um and what what i do and what we do here with the, at exchange commercial real estate is we actually do a lot of cold calling well that cold calling has now become lukewarm or warm calling uh over time because you know i call every single investor uh, or sorry, a real estate owner, probably about every 60 or 90 days, depending on what they've told me and talked about, where our kind of banter has come from. Um, and that's in the Kansas City market. And so you have to have a broker that is, I think, willing to do that or somebody who is extremely well connected and been in the business for 50 years and is dedicated to you uh, as an investor, which I've found most brokers in this um in this marketplace in the multifamily side in particular are very much seller brokers, meaning they're talking to sellers and getting listings, which is great, great business model. You have almost you know guaranteed income as long as you're not overpricing your multifamily piece. Um, but you know, over here, what we're trying to do is really work with buyers. And so we try to match up a buyer with a seller at the opportune time to get transactions done, typically off market. Um, and we're oftentimes representing the buyer. So I think to answer your question, long story short is you need to find a broker who has good connections to, um, to off market deals uh, and understands the market. And that is very difficult. You know, everybody is selling multifamily very fast and, um, but having you know somebody who's working hard, consistent communication with sellers, consistent communication with buyers, you got to get your broker's attention. And the best way to get your broker's attention is to continuously provide feedback to that broker. So you're going to say, hey, look, here's my number on this deal. Where's your number? Or why is your number higher or lower? And continuing to do that, and maybe your numbers aren't ever going to work out. And then you have to decide at that point, am I going to you know, pay the taxes or am I going to buy something that's a pretty surefire bet? I'm not overpaying in this market mm -hmm. because everybody's paying this price. Um, so anyway, it just kind of depends on your investment thesis, but you've got to have a really good relationship with a broker and you can build that rapport quickly by providing feedback, talking to them, emailing them, looking for more. So I think that's important. And that's specifically what you guys do on behalf of the buyers, correct? That's right. Yeah, we're we're working typically to represent the buyer in finding uh, a deal for their replacement property. Um, I've got a, a case study right now that's going on where I had a buyer who is looking was looking. You know, he's on a ten thirty one exchange deadline. Very specific about what he wants. Usually, there's no way in heck I'm going to be able to hit those requirements. But there is a seller that I had been speaking to and kind of gained a friendship with him over a couple of years of just talking to him about his property. 
And when this exchange came up, I immediately thought of this seller. I was like, guys, this is this could be a perfect fit. Let's see if we can make a deal happen. And so far, we're we're trying our best. And so, um, you know, that's that's what we pride ourselves on is really, you know, making everybody happy by connecting buyers and sellers, not just being for one side or the other mm -hmm. uh, all the time. Yeah. So uh, as we're wrapping up here, I just want to ask, have we missed anything? What I mean, I know there's a lot more to this subject than what we've covered, but uh, anything else that you feel the need to get out there for people to understand and be able to better take advantage of the 1031? Yeah, there's a couple key things. One is when you're considering selling a property, find a qualified intermediary. Even if you don't do an exchange, it only costs you a few hundred bucks um, to start. And it might cost you only $2,000 for qualified intermediary period. So anyway, find that qualified intermediary. Then before you even list it, then as you're going through, make sure that your qualified intermediary actually is going to take control of the funds. The title company knows about it, et cetera. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, then make sure you get your three properties identified and preferably at least one of those under contract before the end of your 45 days identification period. That gives you the best chance for success. As you're going through that, keep in mind of always being reasonable because you're the one that if this doesn't work out, you're gonna have to pay taxes on it. Seller is at that point not worried about it because it's their property, they can sell to somebody else. Um, and then at the end of the day, get it closed out, get it going, even if it's not a perfect property, by the way, you can sell that property and do it again if you need to. Uh, versus paying all your capital gains on it. So just keep that in mind as you're going through the processes. It may not be a perfect system, but if you continue and you do it the right way, you always have more chances. Very cool. Well, I mean, this is this has been an incredibly educational conversation. Um, I want to give people the chance. I'm, I'm sure there are a, a lot more questions out there. So uh, I want to give people the chance to get a hold of you. How can they do that? Yeah, you can go to our website at www.exchangecre.com. Uh, you can email me, alex at exchangecre.com. And of course, I'm all over LinkedIn. Um, if you're able to see you know, this photo here or this video, you can see me and match up my face with, uh, with the LinkedIn picture. But I'm in Kansas City, Alex Wilson, Kansas City, real estate broker. Kind of hard to miss that, I think, on LinkedIn. So those are my favorite ways to connect for sure. Very cool. Well, um, I'll make sure to get those links in the show notes so everybody can uh, reach out to you as they see fit. And uh, yeah, man, hey, this has been great. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. Loved it. I wanted to quickly touch on something that Alex and I spoke about after the recording went off. I asked him what his thoughts were on the 1031 exchange being phased out by legislators since there was a lot of chatter about that not too long ago. However, his opinion on that is that it's been put on the back burner for you know pretty much an in indefinite period of time uh, based on a few different reasons. Number one being the pandemic. Number two being the Ukrainian crisis uh, going on and dominating the world news. And of course, number three, because any changes to the 1031 would negatively affect legislators on both sides of the aisle who use it for their own real estate investments. It's just not going to happen. So, and, and I don't know about you, but uh, you know, I thought that Alex shared a wealth of knowledge today, you know, just a, a ton of information. And I'm definitely planning to utilize him in the future. But the main point from today's episode is clear. You can save tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars by implementing a 1031 strategy for your real estate portfolio. If you want to secure a bigger piece of that wealth pie for yourself, this is a great way to go about it. Wait a second. Did I just make a pie joke on pie day? Ha <laughs> ha! You bet I did. Just keep in mind, though, you can't go about this alone. Whether you go through Alex or someone else to handle your 1031 exchange, get them involved early and often with your plans. You'll be glad that you did. Now, that's going to do it for today's episode. Thank you guys so much for listening. And, uh, you know, as always, stay safe and take care of each other out there. Get a piece of pie while you're at it. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Plan B CRNA podcast. If you haven't already subscribed and reviewed the show, I'd be honored if you took the extra time. It really helps to expand our reach and get the word out about the show. If you're a CRNA who is interested in sharing your story on our podcast, I'd love to have you. 
please email me at bobby at oncallinvestments.com for more information. This episode was brought to you by On Call Capital. They are dedicated to helping providers like you develop passive income and generational wealth through investments in the apartment and alternative investment spaces. Feel free to check out their website at www.oncallinvestments.com and subscribe to their free educational email series. You can find On Call Capital on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also check out our YouTube page where you'll find all of the show episodes along with other educational videos. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode.